Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Word from the Lord. James Olfer here with you. And as always, we're glad that you're with us. Hope you're ready for another study from God's Word. I want to put our contact information up here for you in case you want to reach us by email, wordfromthelord at gmail.com, 276 340 2653 is how you can reach me by phone. We meet at 250 The Boulevard in Eden. We meet on Sunday mornings at 9 and 10, and Thursday nights at 7 o'clock for Bible study. We just started the, the book of 1 Corinthians, so if you want to uh, join us for that study. We'd be glad to have you uh, out and uh, enjoy that study with us. And if you have any questions, of course, we're always glad to answer that. We, uh, we enjoy studying the Bible together, and we hope that you will take advantage of the opportunities that you have to study God's Word with us. Um, we're only interested in finding out what God's Word has to say for us and, and helping you do the same thing. And so if you come study with us, you'll help us by... Uh, you know, provoking us to study and making us look and search diligently to make sure that what we're saying is is indeed true. I mean, it, it never hurts to uh, ask questions or to examine what someone else is saying. Maybe they might have uh, missed something, and when you ask a question, it helps them go back and look. I know plenty of times when people call in on the program and they ask us questions, it uh, spurs you to, to think, and you say, well, you know what, I need to study that a little bit more even, and or something pops in your mind, you say, I need to uh, research that a little bit more as well. So you go back and you learn uh, even more than what you uh, uh, once knew. So studying the Bible is a good thing. We hope that you will come and study God's Word with us. Tonight we're going to uh, just begin by <clears throat> starting off with a verse from, from the book of Micah. You know, we uh, are in the middle of a season, I guess, I think everybody is focused on, uh, most people I think are focused on, Jesus and his birthday and things like that and they they think about God for some reason around this time when most of the time they don't think about him the rest of the year but Micah has a, makes a statement in Micah 7 verses 18 and 19 he says who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage he retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy he will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And that will cast all their sin into the depths of the sea. Now, the, the statement I want to look at, I mean, we all understand this about God. And I think most people would, would say God is a compassionate God. He uh, forgets, uh, forgives our sins and can uh, pardon our iniquities and so forth. But who is a God like unto thee? That's a statement that just sticks out to me when I think about what people in today's society really think about God. When most people think about God, they don't think about how great God is, how wonderful it is, and what all he does for us. I submit to you that most people, and it's evident by their actions in, in this time of the year, most people don't say, who is a God like unto thee? They say, who is a God like unto me? Now, they might not physically or literally verbalize that, but I submit to you that their actions and their choices they make in life, the things they believe, the things they go about doing, really show that they're looking for a God like unto me and rather than saying to God, who is a God like unto thee? Instead, they're asking a question, who can be a God like unto me? Because I submit to you that individuals are really gods unto themselves. They want a God that's like them. And that's nothing new. You say, well, James, that's kind of far-fetched. I don't think anybody's ever done said that before. I think they have. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 1, verse 22. He says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. And so when you think about our society, how it is so enamored and so enthralled with stuff, materialism, humanism. You know, men uh, men look at God and they say, well, he's dumb. I mean, look how smart all the scientists are. And they think that wisdom from the Bible, wisdom from God, is foolish. And that's exactly what Paul said they said. In 1 Corinthians, if you'll notice, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, he says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, foolishness. But unto us which are, are saved, it is the power of God. Now notice, he says, 
For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of the preaching to save them to believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stone of block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. The world listens, uh, looks at Christ and says, well, you know, it's just he, he was just a good man. At best, they might say that. But when you talk about the wisdom that you find in, that's found in the Bible, most people would say, well, you know, the Bible and true science, they just don't go hand in hand. You just can't have science and religion all together. But really, friends, when you think about it, the wisdom of God is smarter than all the wisdom of man put together. And the things that are written in the Bible show the wisdom of God, how it far far exceeds the wisdom of man. I mean, here's men talking about, well, global warming, global warming, global warming. And they start to say, call it climate change now because they know that it's not really warming right now. Have you been outside lately? Have you been up in the Northeast? I mean, there was a blizzard back in, uh, there was a, I think, blizzard up in uh, Colorado or somewhere earlier this year. I'm talking about in like uh, uh, October maybe. And here it was, here it was, you know, we're supposed to be warming up. You know, Al Gore is flying across all over the, the world telling about how we need to lower our carbon emissions and he's flying around his big Lear jets and, and uh, burning up fossil fuel left and right. It's not global warming, friends. Does the climate change? Of course climate change. But the wisdom of God says that there will always be hot and cold, summer and winter, the seasons, spring and fall, sea time and harvest. And that's not going to change as long as the world stands. So I don't know why we're getting all bent out of shape about, well, we need to stop driving our cars and we need to stop doing this and that because we're going to destroy the world. Friends, you couldn't destroy the world if you wanted to. Now, you may not be very good stewards of it, but you're not going to, change, you're not going to destroy the world uh, that, that God has said is going to stand until he gets ready to destroy with fire. And so... The, the wisdom of man is really folly when it comes to the uh, wisdom of God. And when we're looking at how people react and how they think they're so much smarter and better and wiser than God, they really want a God like unto them. You look at who people have as their gods. Well, they have ball teams that are their gods, you know, sports teams that are their gods. They have uh, a NASCAR that's their gods. They have jobs that are their gods. They have money, the almighty dollar that's their god. They have, they have everything that they sacrifice to themselves. You don't think man has a god as himself? Think about how many times individuals will say, well, I'm going to have to abort this child because it's an inconvenience. Well, what did you just do? You just sacrificed a child to you, you're the God. Who is a God like unto you? Who is a God like unto me? And that's the way people look at it. Not who is a God like unto thee, but who is a God like unto me. Let's move on here. Let me show you what I mean. We're talking about the center of universe. We live in a world that is so self-centered. They We worship self. Men worship themselves. You don't believe that? You don't believe that? Well, have you turned on the TV or looked into a magazine lately? And what do you see? You say, well, you can have this body. It's fit. I mean, you can be as fit as a Greek god. You know, crossfit, hiking, biking, cycling. Now, I'm not putting down exercise. Everybody needs to exercise. I, I can stand and do a little bit of exercise. But I'm talking about people worship the body, the human body, the human form. Have you looked at the Olympics lately? They ain't wearing no clothes. Why? Well, we're just glorying in the, in the God that is mankind. And look what Paul goes on to say there in, in Romans. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and served the creature more than the creator. Who are you really worshiping, friends? Who is really your God? You're not saying like Micah, who's a God unto thee? 
and admiring God and all his awesome power and his wondrous works and the glory that he's bestowed upon us, you're saying, who's a God like unto me? You say, well, James, I don't think I'm saying that. Oh, oh, yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. Here's, here's why I'm saying that. You think about people who say God is like unto them. Someone put this little meme together here. God says, you shall have no other God before me. And the atheist says, I shall have no other gods besides me. You say, well, James, I'm not like, I'm not like the atheist. Well, let's just start with the atheist. The atheists don't say, who is a God like unto thee? They say, who is a God like unto me? Because atheists, they have a God that looks like them. They actually have a God that looks like them. The atheist God looks like themselves. How do I know that? Well, because listen when they talk. Listen to what they say. Listen to what they say about who makes the choices in their life. Who's making the decisions in their life. Who is, who is the standard that, is, that they're living up to. It is themselves. Take a listen. Uh, in the humanist world, here's, here's my question. In the humanist world, does everyone get to be their own God? In other words, standard, they get to determine what's right and wrong? And if not, what's, what is the standard of right and wrong? <coughs> Can I get over here sure. and be sure. seen in front of what you... Yeah. Uh, in the humanist world, does everyone get to be their own God? No. The social, it sounds like socialism, and you all hate it. No, the humanist world does not get to be their own God because we don't believe in a God. We don't believe in the supernatural. We believe everything's part of nature. Everything. We don't believe in anything supernatural. We may not understand it. As I said, you may not. If your car, if you don't understand how a car engine works, you still don't have to believe that a car, your car goes down the street because God's blowing on it. We can understand some things. No, we don't believe. No secular humanist has thoroughly thought this out believes there is a God. And if not, what is the standard of right and wrong? And as I said before, the standard of right and wrong is being a human, having an affinity for other humans and other living things, and having a conscience. That's the way I see it. Okay, now, see, Mr. missed a question. Larry Server missed a question. I said, do you get to be your own God? And he goes, no, we don't believe in God. Well, they do believe in God. They are their own God. I'm not saying that they believe in a supernatural being, but the atheists believe that they are their own God. Here's why I'm saying that. Because when you ask them, who gets to determine what's right and wrong, who gets to determine what's right and wrong, they say, themselves. In fact, I think subjective morality is superior because it comes from your conscience. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. All right, listen to that one more time. In fact, I think subjective morality is superior because it comes from your conscience. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. All right, subjective morality is, is superior than objective morality. Now, what, now let's, let's define these terms. Subjective morality means each, each uh, uh, person, each subject gets to make their own standard of morality. Objective morality is you have a standard that's apart from everybody else and everybody has to look to it and say, that's what's right and that's what's wrong. That's the Bible. I'm saying objective morality is right here. The atheist says subjective morality is superior. Well, by saying subjective morality is superior here, he just answered that he thinks he's his own God. He gets to choose what's right and what's wrong. He gets to choose what's, what's best for him. And later on, I, we asked uh, Larry if uh, everybody had lived to his standard. He said, yeah, I want everybody to live to my standard. Let's just listen to that. I believe that's right here. Do because they're how conscious do you, or not. How do you do because it, it's, there's a difference between a highly developed, highly evolved well, what is, conscious. What does a highly developed conscious look like then? See? That's what we're getting to. We're getting down to the fact that you realize something is, is morally wrong and there is a higher standard that everybody has to live to. And the problem is there, you just don't want to live to it. You don't want to admit that it has to come from something that's bigger than you I or me don't. or Tiger Woods. I certainly don't. And the problem is there, you just don't want to live to it. You don't want to admit that it has to come from something that's bigger than you I or me don't. or Tiger Woods. I certainly don't. He, di he didn't want to live to something that's higher than him. He wants to live to himself. Well, the atheist has a God, and the atheist sees his God every morning when he looks in the mirror. They look in the mirror and say, well, this, this, is, this is my God. This is who I worship. I worship myself. 
That's what the atheist says. And so the only, the only God or the only higher power, the only creature that's worthy of their praise and adoration is really themselves. Uh, here's what Ann uh, Laurie Gaylor said. She's a, uh, of the uh, Freedom from Religion Foundation. The only higher power we can truly invoke lies in our own minds and our own intelligence. There's their higher power. There's their higher, the higher intellect, their higher mind. See, their highest intellect is only in the mind of a man. So the atheist has a God that looks like themselves. You say, well, James, you know, that, that's just the atheist. Everybody knows the atheist. They don't believe in God. They don't, they don't believe in objective morality. They want to do their own thing and don't want anybody to tell them what to do. So, but that's not true of everybody else. Oh, really? You see, just because someone, like the atheist, has a God that looks like themselves doesn't mean that someone else may not have a God that looks a little differently. You know, when you read through the uh, book of Acts, you get to Acts chapter 17, you have the Apostle Paul coming to the, to the uh, Mars Hill, and he says, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very superstitious, for as I uh, pass by your idols, as I pass by your, your, your devotions, I've held your devotions, uh, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Whom uh, therefore you are to, uh, you enter to worship him that I declare unto you. So they had all these devotions, very superstitious, very religious. Do you think all those gods looked the same? No. Do you think they all looked alike? No. They all had different functions in the lives of the worshipers. So just because the atheist has a uh, has a god that looks like himself, that doesn't mean that he's the only person that has a God that looks like themselves. Let me give you an example. The KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, they have gods that look like themselves. They have a God that looks like them. Now, how do I know that? Well, listen to what they say. Now, this is, this is from the writings of uh, Eli James. He's the, the former clud of the Ku Klux Klan. He's the man that came on and uh, I've invited him back to have a debate again anytime he comes in the area. I don't think he comes to this part of the country anymore. <clears throat> and uh, really, it really doesn't surprise me. I guess one of the guys that helped bring him down here, I just uh, read an article in, in the news, uh, Fox News, uh, local news, that uh, he's in, uh, been arrested for aiding and abetting uh, uh, attempted murder, uh, stabbed, stabbed a fellow Klansman in the chest. So, which, by the way, by the way, when people say the KKK is not violent anymore, there you go, all right? But I digress here. But let me show you. Let me show you. The KKK, the white supremacists, they have a God that looks like them. Because here's what they say. Here's what they say. It says, therefore, the Holy Bible is the history of the white race. The Holy Bible is the history of the white race. That's what the Christian identity movement uh, uh, says. All right. Later to become known as Anglo-Saxons after Isaac, as the scriptures relate. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Genesis 21, 12. Note that the Jews do not recognize the Anglo-Saxon as Israelites despite this prophecy. Then he says, Sapphire in any dictionary reads the blue color of the gem sapphire. This is used biblically in reference to the blue eyes when describing certain Adamic men. Uh, Adamic, Adamic, Adamic men. Really? Blue eyes in the Bible? Describing uh, the descendants of Adam? Hmm, interesting. The declaration of the scripture states, this is the book of the generation of Adam in the day that God created man in the likeness of God made he him. Genesis 5.1 It therefore becomes imperative that we explore, ponder, and investigate all we can about the man Adam and his descendants. Well, I don't recall in Genesis 5 when, God said, when the Bible says God made Adam that he made him with blue eyes. <clears throat> matter of fact, I don't really know that the Bible gives any description of what Adam looks like. But apparently, because the Christian identity movement, the religious affiliation of the Ku Klux Klan, thinks that the Bible is the history of the white race that 
God looks like them. That that's what God looks like. If God made Adam in his own image, right? And therefore, he, he made Adam and gave him blue eyes and, you know, a ruddy complexion and so forth. And then he says, our first great clue to understanding the man Adam is to understand the meaning of his name, which we now know. After establishing the proper background, we may then proceed to examine his descendants in the book of Adam, which is the Bible. Now, friend, see how silly that is? To say the Bible is the is the what the history of the white race? See, they, they think God looks like them. Now why do I say that? Because they say God is the God of the white race. The white race is God's chosen people. What have they done? They have given God an attribute that they want to see in Him. You know, I find it very amazing that oftentimes that's what people do. They look and they see something in someone that they want to believe in, and that's, you know, you just can't change that. They're convinced that this person is what they want him to be. They did the same thing with Jesus. They did the same thing with Jesus. The Jews did the same thing with Jesus. They looked at him and they said, this is going to be a God like us. What do we mean? They thought he was going to be a physical king. They thought that he had the same aspirations, the same ideas, the same desires that they had. And that's why the Bible says in John chapter 6, John chapter 6, uh, I believe it's verse 15, uh, I guess I need to, John 6, let's see if I got this right. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. What would they do? They had in mind this is what the Messiah is going to be like. They wanted a God like unto them, not a God like unto thee. They were saying to God, hey, we want a God like us, like me, not like thee. Well, that's what, the, that's what the KKK does. That's what the Christian identity movement, that's what the white supremacists do. They say that God is, is looking down upon the white race and, and therefore they have special favor with him. How silly. Is that any different than what the, what the, uh, 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 the atheist says? Well, you know what? But the, the white supremacists aren't the only ones that say that. They're not the only ones that say that. The nation of Islam says it too. Look at this. The nation of Islam's God looks like them. The atheist God looks like the atheist. The white supremacist God looks like the white supremacist. The black supremacist God looks like the black supremacists. Listen to this. Listen to what uh, this discussion between Johnny and Malvester. Look at that, look at that. Just killed the a black man, man for no reason. The white man did and, 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 uh, did, yeah. did he lie? Did he lie? Did your man lie when he said the white man's a devil? It... Now, Master Farrard Muhammad, the Nation of Islam's prophet, said the white man's the devil. As a matter of fact, they say the black man created the white man. See, the black man's God. That God is black. Well, what are they doing? Hey, we want a God like us. We want a, we want a God. We have in mind a God, and he looks like us. Really? Is that really what God looks like? Because the white, the white supremacist over here says that God is white. The black supremacist says God is black. You know what? I think you're both wrong. I know you're both wrong. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. John 4, verse 24. You're both wrong. You don't, you don't need to be wanting a God like you. You know what? I don't want a God like you. And you certainly don't want a God like me. You should want a God that is far above what any man can conjure up or what any man devises in his mind. But yet here you have a group going, well, you know what? Yeah, God, God's black. God's black. And we say, well, that's silly. The atheist says that God looks like him. The atheist is his own God. The white supremacist says God's white. The black supremacist says that God is black. Here's what it says. 
Message to the message to the black man. Is God a spirit or a man? God is a man. We'll just stop right there for a minute. God is a man? Now, the God of the Bible is not a man. The God of the Bible is a spirit. Now, he came in the form of a man when Christ became flesh and dwelt among men, John 1 verse 14, but he's a spirit. But now, the nation of Islam's God is like unto them. He's a man. God is a man and we just cannot make him other than man lest we make him an inferior one. For man's intelligence has no equal in other than men. In, in other than man. His wisdom is infinite. His wisdom is infinite? Capable of accomplishing anything that his brain can conceive. Man's wisdom is infinite? That means it doesn't have an end. Man's wisdom is infinite? Really? Stop and just ponder that for a minute, friends. The nation of Islam's God is a man, number one, and he has and he's a man that has infinite wisdom. Well boy, I tell you what, how come how come the nation of Islam's God hadn't cured cancer yet? Infinite wisdom? Surely he knows how what happened, right? How come he hadn't cured all the plagues in the world? Surely he knows the answer, right? I mean, I have a lady that called in and she's talking about how smart Malvester was. Well, if Malvester's that smart, surely, surely the nation of Islam's God is smarter than that. But they have God. God looks like them. According to the dictionary of the Bible, <clears throat> Teman, a son of Esau by Ada, and in 1 Chronicles 136, now if Habakkuk saw God come or coming from the sons of Esau, then God must be a man. Well, Teman is not just a person. Teman is also a place. All right? Number one. And to say that God came from Teman is to say that he came from the east or from a direction, not to say that he came or was born of a man. But here, the nation of Islam's God, he's a man. He was born of a man. He must be a man. Why? Why do they say that? Because they want a God like themselves. That's my whole point, friends. Instead of sitting back and saying, what a, what a great and powerful and majestic and almighty God, that created the heavens and the earth, <clears throat> God of all people, God of all nations, that can make of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the earth, Acts 17, 26, instead of saying, what a great God that is, they say, oh no, 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 no. We want God to be like us. We want to change the nature of God, change the God into a God like the creature. We want to change God to look like us. Who is a God like unto me? Instead of saying, who is a God like unto thee? Oh yeah, God must be a man. God must be a man. This is Elijah Muhammad asking Wallace Farrar Muhammad. He said, I ask him, who are you and what is your real name? He said, I am the one that the world has been expecting for the past 2,000 years. I said to him again, what is your name? He said, my name is Mahdi. I am God. Well, there's your God. A God like unto you. A man. A man that was born of a man. That's your God? Really, that's your God? What happened to your God? He's dead, isn't he? Your God is dead. Now see how silly that is for someone to say, well, I want a God like unto, like unto me. I want, a, I want a God that looks like me. But we scoff at the atheist because the atheist says, I want a God like me. But the white supremacist says the same thing. I want a God like me. And the black supremacist says, I want the same thing. I want a God like me. 
Friends, why don't, why don't we just say, you know what? I don't want a God like any of you. I want a God like the God of the Bible. I want a God that is more powerful and more wise and wiser and far greater than anything man can conjure up. We say, well, you know, the atheist and the white supremacist and the and the Mormons. There, I mean, uh, uh, the the uh, Nation of Islam. They're they're all just kind of fringe over there. You know, they're kind of out there on. They're not in the mainstream. Most people don't think that don't think that way about what God looks like. Well. What about the Mormons? The Mormons have a God that looks like them. Here's what they say. Here's what they say. We believe in God who is himself progressive, whose majesty is intelligence, <clears throat> whose perfection consists in eternal advancement, a being who has attained his exalted state by a path which now his children are permitted to follow, whose glory is is in their heritage to share. Now stop and think about that. Their God is progressive. Right? Their God is progressive. He has advanced, you know, to perfection. A being who has attained, he's attained an exalted state. He wasn't always exalted, but he's gotten there. And now his children can follow down the same path. They're telling you what their God looks like. They're telling you what their God looks like. Their God looks like them. They say, in spite of the opposition of the sects, in the face of direct charges of blasphemy, the church, is talking about the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon church, proclaims the eternal truth, quote, as man is, God once was. As God is, man may be. God was a man. God was once a man. Now, you laughed when you said when when we said the the nation of Islam said that message to the black man says God's a man, right? He said, ah, that's far fetched. The Mormon said too. The Mormon said too. So you got the atheists have a God like themselves. You got the the KKK has a God like themselves. The Nation of Islam has a God like themselves. And the Mormons have a God like themselves. Do you see what we're talking about, friends? The problem is everybody wants to be their own God. Everybody wants to be. They have this idea of what God is or what God should be. And they want to mold and fashion and shape and twist. And they want to pack God into the mold that they have in their mind. You say, well, I'd never do that. I would never pigeonhole God into being something that, that he wasn't, that the Bible didn't say he was. You say, well, I would, never, I would never force God to be something like that. I would never, I would never make God something or someone that, that he's not. Friend, do you realize that whenever you take a doctrine that is contrary to the Bible, what you're really doing is you're making God like you. You're making God look like you. You're saying, well, this is what I think is right, therefore God's happy with it. This is, this is what I feel. This is what I think. And instead of finding out what God says about it, I'm just going to assume God wants it that way. You say, well, I would never, I would never be like these groups. Those people you just talked about, the, the Mormons, the Nation of Islam, the, the, uh, the uh, Christian identity, the white supremacist, or the, uh, or the atheists, I would never be that way. What about this? What about the Primitive Baptist? You know, the Primitive Baptist, and I don't know if I've got this video pulled up, but the Primitive Baptists have a God that looks like them. Um, are you are you one of the elect? Are you one of these individuals that the uh, that can understand the spiritual things? Or and how do you know that? How do I know that I'm one of the elect? Yes, sir. By proof and evidence that uh, take you over to uh, uh, Thess Thessalonians. Uh, Thessalonians says, Knowing, brethren, beloved, you're the elect of God, 
For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. So Paul said, I know you're the elect of God, brethren, because our gospel came not unto you in just word. That is, you just didn't hear the word. There was a response within these people that Paul said, I know that God elected you before the foundation of the world. I know that God loved you before the foundation of the world because uh, that there was a response. And if there was a response, then they had to be children of God to respond uh, to the message. Okay. But, well, how do you know that, that, that that's applying to you, I guess is what I'm saying. I mean, how do I know? I'm talking to you. How do I know that it's me? Yes, sir. Because I responded uh, to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and therefore it gave me the evidence or the proof that I was one of the elect of God. Uh, belief is an evidence that you're elect of God. Uh, belief is an evidence that you're elect of God. Uh, belief is an evidence that you're elect of God. Uh, belief is an evidence that you're elect of God. Loving God is an evidence that you're elect of God. Loving God is an evidence that you're elect of God. Loving God is an evidence that you're elect of God. Loving God is an evidence that you're elect of God. Loving God is an evidence that you're elect of God. Why do you love God? Because He first loved you. That's why okay. people... Can I, can I insert something? He says also, though, that persons who don't love God are elect. So how can you have it both ways? Your evidence is that you love God, so you're elect, but you affirm that people who don't love God are as actually elect. So, again, isn't that kind of circular? No, that's not circular. I said the evidence or the proof that you are an elect of God is your response to spiritual things. The evidence or the proof that you are an elect of God is your response to spiritual things. The evidence or the proof that you are an elect of God is your response to spiritual things. Okay, That's the what evidence. About the, what about the person who doesn't respond? Do you affirm that there are some out there who don't respond that are actually the elect? Yes. Okay, so how is that your evidence, but it's no evidence that they are? How well, would you know? Do you, can you? All right. Now, see, friends, here's what we're talking about. Here's a man. That, that says that God has a chosen group of people, the elect few, and he's one of them. He's one of them because he did so. He responded to God's uh, message. He responded to the gospel, so he's one of the elect. But he also teaches that so, there are some people out there that don't respond to the elect, that don't believe in God, that don't love God, and yet they're going to be a part of the few too. And the reason why he has to say that is because He's pigeonholed God into looking like him. He believes something and he thinks this is what God looks like. He thinks that there's only a few people, therefore God must, that really must be what God looks like. See, the elect, the elect are, are just a certain number of people and that number doesn't change according to the primitive Baptist doctrine. And so my point is, is this, when you start making up or devising a, a doctrine, then you start making God look like you. Whereas if you were taking the Bible and you were saying, okay, this is what I believe because the Bible says it and it doesn't contradict the Bible anywhere else, therefore that's the way God is, now you're conforming to God. But when you change the doctrine of the Bible, when you change what the Bible teaches, you're starting to change God to look like you. You're trying to make him fit your pattern. Now, the idea of the elect says that if you are one of them, you cannot not be one of them. In other words, if you are one of the elect that God says is going to be saved, there's nothing you can do to get out of it. You're going to go to heaven kicking and screaming <clears throat> because God wants you in heaven. And if you're not one of the elect, you're going to go to hell kicking and screaming because God says that's where you're going to go. Now, can you imagine that, friends? Can you imagine God creating man in his own image, putting him in the garden, giving him the choice to eat of the fruit or not eat of the fruit, 
And then turn around, but then turn around saying, well, you know, you really didn't have a choice. You mean Adam and Eve didn't have a choice? Apparently, they didn't have a choice because God determined if they were going to do something or not do something. When you start pigeonholing God, you make him like you. You're saying God is only going to save a certain number of people? That God has already foreordained a certain number of people? And everybody else is going to be lost and that number is not going to change one way or the other? How many people in the world? Six and a half, seven billion? I don't know what the number is right now. And out of all those people, God has determined already the number that's going to be saved. And everybody else is going to be lost. And if you want to be saved, there's nothing you can do. You can't, you can't buy your way into heaven. You're going to go to hell if God doesn't want you in heaven. And if you want to go to hell, you can't buy your way into hell either. You can do whatever you want to do. You can go out and fornicate. You can do drugs. You can murder. You can rob, steal, kill. You can do everything, anything that's, you know, uh, illegal, immoral, and fattening. And you can just do what you want to do. And hey, you, you're going to go to heaven if God wants you to go to heaven. See, the Bible clearly says, though, whosoever... And puts it to the fact that anybody who chooses to obey God will be accepted. Matthew chapter 7, Matthew 7 and 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them must be one of the elect. Otherwise, they couldn't hear it or do it. No, that's not what he says. <clears throat> Heareth and do these things of mine, I will liken to him to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. But by the same token, you see what the primitive Baptist says? Whosoever heareth these things of mine and doeth them can still go to hell because God didn't choose you? Friends, that's eater scum to see. Where is that infinite wisdom that man has? Oh, I guess that God doesn't look like them then, right? See, the nation of Islam God doesn't look like the primitive Baptist God. The primitive Baptist God doesn't have finite wisdom, I guess. I don't know. Or infinite wisdom. You start making God look like yourself. Jesus said that anybody who does the will of the Father is going to be his, his family. Matthew 12, verse 48. He answered and said unto them that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward the disciple and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. And the converse of that is, Whosoever will not do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is not my brother, and is not my sister, and is not my mother. Jesus put the condition of being in his family based upon whether you do with the will of the Father. In other words, he said there's a choice there. There's a God, a God like unto, unto you, huh? I don't want to be like the God of the primitive Baptist. I don't want to be like the God of the nation of Islam. I don't want to be, I don't want, I don't want a God that looks like the white supremacist. I don't want a God that looks like the atheist. See, I don't, I don't want to make God conform to, to my whims. Acts 2 and verse 40. Acts 2 and verse 40. The Bible, as... Peter standing on the day of Pentecost. Notice what he says to them. They said, Many brethren, what shall we do? And he said, Repent and be baptized every one in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he come on down. Verse 40. And with many other words that he testified and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. 
as long as you're one of the chosen few. Why would you even tell anybody what you must do to be saved? If God had already predetermined and pre-elected the number, and you don't know if you're one of them or if you're not one of them, why would you even do it? Why go through the effort? Why waste the time? Is that really what your God looks like? Your God's going to let someone in who won't obey Him and is going to kick someone out of heaven who wants to obey Him. Well, I don't want a God like that. I don't want a God like that. And by the way, why why would we condemn or castigate, chastise, chide the atheist or the white supremacist or the black supremacist or the Mormon for creating a God that they want, molding a God in their image, creating a God like they want, and then say, well, the primitive Baptist is not like that. Oh, yeah, they are. Think about it this way. The KKK and the Nation of Islam, we condemn them because, well, you say that only a certain color of people are going to be saved. God only wants a certain color of people. But the primitive Baptist comes along and says, well, only a certain number of people are going to be saved. There's no difference. You're still making God look like what you think he should look like. Now, why not just say, who's a God like unto thee? Friends, you need to realize that God is nothing like us. God is far, far above us. In Numbers 23 and verse 19, <clears throat> it says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and he shall, hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? If God says it, it's going to happen. Peter says, God is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness. God is not like a man. So any religion that comes along and says, well, God is a man, or God is like a man, God favors a certain man, that is not the God of the Bible. That's making God look like that man. I don't want any part of that. I want a God that is far, far superior to man, that won't lie, that won't cheat, that won't steal that won't uh, give in to, to his desires and, and uh, uh, mistreat people. Listen, Isaiah 55 verse 8. Isaiah, Isaiah 55 verse 8. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. When men bring God down to their level, that shows how little they think of God. It shows how little they think of the Bible to try to relegate God to something that they have created or they've devised. You might as well be worshiping a log out here, worshiping a stick. You might as well be out there rubbing a little fat boot on the belly if that's how you think about God, if that's how you really feel about it. God is not liking a man. God is not liking a man. Friends, our goal in the church of Christ as we're proclaiming the gospel is to make ourselves like God in the sense of we want to imitate his goodness and his holiness. 2 Peter 1 verses 3 and 4 
2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. Listen to what Peter says. According as the divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, <clears throat> that ye might by these be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In other words, God has provided a way for us to <clears throat> live a holy, pure life in this life so that we then can spend eternity with him. Now, he's given us all these things. He's, he's far above us. But he wants us to be like him in being holy. 1 Peter 1 verse 5, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Friends, we can be like God. We can exhibit characteristics of holiness and righteousness, justice, love, mercy. Those all come from God. But it's not because God is a man like us, but it's because God is far superior to us, but yet because he loved us enough that he provided us the means by which we can be like him, be like the Father. Paul said in Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21, he said, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. We're looking to be like God. Not because we have uh, ascended and traversed to a different state like the Mormons teach but because we have followed God's will and one day we'll be at home with him. John says that we will be, we don't know what Christ looks like, but we know that one day we'll be like him. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Our goal, our, our, our objective in life is to be faithful to God so that he will take us home with him. Everyone who is righteous in his eyes will go home with him. Not like the, not like, uh, the primitive Baptists say, just a certain few. Peter said, anyone, everyone, whosoever, whosoever worketh righteousness. God is not a respected person, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. No certain number. The God of the Bible is not the God of the primitive Baptist. The God of the Bible is a God that will take anybody who obeys him. The God of the Bible is not like the nation of Islam or the, the white supremacist. The God of the Bible says all nations, right? Out of every nation, God will accept those who are faithful and righteous uh, and, and fearfully righteous before him. The God of the Bible is not like the, the Mormons, not a man. And we're not trying to be a, an exalted and elevated man. The God of the Bible is not like the, like the atheist. The God of the Bible is above all of that, and that's what we're striving to do. We're striving to study his word to know more about him. Friends, we're, we're out of time. But I hope that this has encouraged you and helped you to think about who really is your God and who you're really serving. Hope that you're, that the God you want to serve is not a God like unto you, but a God like unto our Heavenly Father in Heaven. If we can assist you in any way, we'd like you to please 
Call us, 276-340-2653 at wordfromlord at gmail.com. We'll be glad to help you and assist you in any way we can. Until next time, friends, thanks for watching, and always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.